Welcome to Aussie Lawn Stars. I've created Aussie Lawn Stars to give you professional help free. And you'll also find Lawn Care Skull Sessions and the Australian Lawn Garden Podcast doing the same thing. On Facebook, you can look up the Lawn Mowing Contractors Australia Group or the Australian Professional Contractors Group. And if you want help that is personalised and takes you a little bit further, then you should look up Prez Madley. He offers personal coaching, business coaching and corporate coaching. Email him on thinktankcoaching at outlook.com. You could also book an appointment with my accountants, Prosper Financial, on 0249 77 3363 if you need help getting your business and bookkeeping in order. Today I'd like to welcome Husqvarna into my dungeon, except it's not my dungeon, it's in their showroom. And I've moved all of my dungeon gear into Husqvarna's showroom and set up. And we've got two guys from Husqvarna participating in the podcast today and it be an interesting one. So first off, I'd like to introduce Simon. Simon, I've only just met you this morning. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you've been with Husqvarna for a while. I have both been with Husqvarna for five years. Yeah, awesome. So we're going to come back to you in a minute and talk about some of the history of Husqvarna as well. Um, over on the other side here, we've got Andrew, and I've known Andrew for a little while now, so we will um, get into depth with some of the product knowledge both you guys have, but um, you've been with Husqvarna for a little while now too, haven't you? Yeah, so three and a half years with Husqvarna. So first as a robotics specialist and now business development for robotics. Yeah, awesome. Uh, and Simon, your specialty, um, is that specific product knowledge or is it across um, other areas? Yeah, so I've been working with Husqvarna products uh, since I was 17. Yeah. Um, I started out in the technical services division yep. and I'm now a product manager for robotics and, and accessories. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, so you've got a fairly broad knowledge base there. We're going to do as much as we can to exhaust that over the next okay. hour or so. <laughs> yeah, so Simon, tell us a bit about Husqvarna. Most of the people that listen to this podcast, or if they get on YouTube and watch it, they'll already know about Husqvarna. But the history with Husqvarna starts where they started in Sweden, correct? Correct, yeah. The company's about 335 years old. Yeah. Um, in Australia... Uh, Husqvarna has been in the country since the 70s. Yeah, I can. Uh, so it was brought in as a sewing machine brand that, st that started importing chainsaws. Yeah. Um, and some of the early saws would be Husqvarna 66s yep. and things like that. Okay. So it's been in Australia for over 50 years now. Yeah, yeah that. Okay. And in Australia, you're saying they started with sewing machines and chainsaws. I'm going to spring this on both of you guys because this one, you know, it's my favorite topic. I ride motorbikes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Husqvarna are pretty renowned for their motorbikes. I ride a KTM, which is, I guess it's under the same umbrella. They're part of the same company when you're talking motorbikes, but um, the talk we're going to be doing today is not related to the motorbikes, and it's almost a separate company, is it? It is these. Do either of you guys ride a motorbike? I ride a man, motorbike, man. but I don't ride it. <laughs> <laughs> it was given to me, so I need to start riding it. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I ride uh, mountain bikes. I think if I had a torque yeah. engine on a bike... <laughs> so, yeah, yep. just mountain bikes. Not yeah. as much as I'd like to. <laughs> yeah, and I think you're, you're more of a car fan, aren't you, Andrew? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen some social media stuff. I'm like, oh, yeah, it'd be interesting to talk to you more about cars. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not what we're here for. I, I get stuck talking to people for mountain bike talk for like 45 minutes on some of my podcasts. Uh, we'll, we'll keep that shorter. <laughs> yeah, I think we could both talk about cars for <laughs> a few hours here. Yeah. So. yeah. I I went through a stage where I was pretty fanatical about cars, but yeah, I'm glad I didn't have a lot of money to spend on them at the time. <laughs> so, um, Simon, let's have a bit more of a talk to you. Sure. Um, we've sort of covered where Husqvarna came into Australia. Now, in 2024, the Husqvarna outdoor power equipment range is quite substantial. It is, yeah. And I'm looking around the showroom, it looks like we've also got some Gardena products here, which, interesting, I've looked at this before, Gardena is part of the Husqvarna company, but it's a separately branded product, so more available to the home users, residential 
yes. Um, when we start swinging around the showroom a bit more, we can see a lot of Husqvarna product. Most of the listeners will be very familiar with a couple of Husqvarna products, and we're going to look at quite a few of them with you now. But the one that springs to mind as like the backbone of the industry for Husqvarna would be the 525 LST. Yep. So that's a petrol tool, whip snipper. Um, and the, the LST is an indication of what it is. But if I understand correctly, the Husqvarna dealer that I was dealing with 10 years ago, that I think, is that how long the 525 LST has been around? It has been around for a long time. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure when we released it, but it's yet. Yeah, so I'm, yep. I'm going to antagonise you here. He showed me the 525 LST and I was pretty bitter about the previous product dealings I had with that dealer. So I went and bought a still FS94R. <laughs> But he he was bragging about it. He's like, you've got to try it. It's so much better than the previous whippersnippers Husqvarna has had. And everybody who uses them says the same thing. So people are either diehard still FS94R or Husqvarna 525 LST. And then there's a, a few nutcases that run the old chimney. Oh, yeah. can't even remember what model it is that compares with that. But tell me, with the LST, that's got a gear reduction in the head, right? Is that, am I right? Um, it does, yeah. So I guess the key features with the 525 LST, it's a one kilowatt motor. It's a solid steel drive shaft, which you'd kind of yep. expect from a pro unit. Yep. Um, it does have a reduction in the bevel gear. Yep. So you do get fast spinning head. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's um, being mostly robotics, I must admit. It's been a while since I've looked at one of those. <laughs> um, <laughs> Fair enough. But yes, no, it's, it's definitely, it's a strong performer. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, look, the thing with Husqvarna products is it's not just about power output or, you know, uh, bells and whistles. It's a lot of it's to do with ergonomics. So you might find that you get the performance out of a 525 LST uh, with reduced weight, better balance and things like that. And that all just equates to nicer, a nicer experience over an extended period of time. Yeah. yeah. Some of the feedback I've heard on the 525 LST, like I said, there's a lot of people in the industry that love it. I haven't used it myself. I've gone for the FS94R, like I said. But the feedback I've heard on the 525 is people either love the ergonomics or they hate it. So I'm not sure if that's a height thing. We were all fairly tall. I think we are all up around six foot. I'm just over six foot. Yeah, um, I find some whippersnippers I've got to lean over to use them or um, you start thinking about going for bullhorns to get a bit more of a natural feel. But most people doing routine residential lawns don't like the bullhorns. They go for the loop handle. That's one of the things I've heard with the 525 is people either love that ergonomics or they don't like it at all yeah okay um the other thing i found with that one i think the fuel tank size comes up occasionally in the size machine that that is and comparing with the other brands they they're not meant to have a massive long run time it's not like a big brush cutter where you want to be out there brush cutting without interruption yeah look i think that's probably a fair comment um but also i mean the bigger the fuel tank the more fuel you're carrying around which yeah it, it can affect you Adds weight, yeah. And those machines that size are meant to be fairly light to work with because you do work with them a lot. So that, that's an interesting one. I, like I said, that has been one of the backbones of the industry for small residential contractors and even a lot of um, commercial use. Yeah. But there's, there's a number of products that we want to run through in the outdoor power equipment range that you're fairly familiar with. Um, Andrew can jump in if he's got some knowledge on these ones as well we're going to spend a lot more time talking to andrew when it comes to robotics and it sounds like you've got lots of experience with robotics as well yeah okay. yeah got a bit yeah so across the range i don't know if people can see behind us here and maybe we want to grab a couple of tools as we talk about them um we've got some battery tools and some petrol tools there and one of the petrol tools that we've just spoken about, the 525 LST, then you look across, you've got a massive big chainsaw. It's a 592 XP. Yep. So the, I think the XP series are all renowned for, like, as far as Husqvarna is concerned, they're, that's a signature of their top-of-the-line commercial machines. Correct. Yeah. Of the X-Torque engine. I think you referred to X-Torque before, Andrew. Um, so what's... What size is that machine? I think it's almost competing with a still 88 in terms of size. I think you've got one bigger than that one. We do, yeah. So we've got a saw about this called the 3120. Yeah. Um, that saw has been in production since, I believe, 1988. And it's been around a while. Range. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's very much a specialty tool. It's 120cc. Yeah. 
So that would be closer to your, your 88s and things yeah. like that. Yep. Um, this product comes in to take the place of another cell that we had for a very long time, being D395 XP. Oh, yeah. Um, now, this is a 92cc auto tune chainsaw. Yep. So that's really the big kind of difference, I guess, if we're looking at specs on paper compared to the 395. Yeah. Um, totally redesigned. So it is very much sort of from the family of the 572 XPs and things like that. Yep. Um, yeah, really good saw. Very strong performer. Yep. Um, kind of scary, actually, just how quickly it chomps through wood. But yeah, no, it's, it's a great saw. Yeah. So that's um, not quite the largest one, but second largest in the range. And you mentioned auto tune on that. Yes. Um, I have a still that's sort of in that same sort of technology era. So not a not a fuel injected machine, but it do, they do have a bit of technology. So the auto tune means does it mean you don't have a choke on that one? Uh, so this product still has a choke. Yep. Um, the way I kind of describe auto tune is it's kind of um, maybe similar to like a closed loop system in a car um, but I guess the simplified way would be it's sort of uh, electronic tuning screws would be very sort of yeah to so so you don't need to take it in for a tune up so to speak but you, you still should get it serviced obviously uh, yep. <laughs> but, servicing's key yeah but your local Husqvarna dealer shouldn't be sitting there fiddling with the car to tune it no absolutely not so basically the the design is still functions like a standard carburetor Yep, um, but it's got sort of variable uh, tuning valves that adjust the mixture. Um, so the saw looks at things like engine temperature, RPM. Yep, but um, also looks at your ignition timing, and it calculates your best air fuel ratio based on the conditions yeah. you're using using the saw. Yeah, okay. Um, what that equates to is basically just better performance across a lot of different types of work, different altitudes, different ambient temperatures. Yep. And it's always finding that sweet spot where it's perfectly tuned. Yeah, okay. So I think a number of petrol machines these days have been modified in ways like that to meet compliance with emissions and still get the performance they need. I think that kind of goes hand in hand. Um, the more efficient the product is, the better fuel consumption is, yep. the more performance you're getting out of out of um, every sort of mill of fuel that the, the product's using. So yeah, it's not necessarily there purely for, well, it's like anything, it's not an emissions driven feature. Yeah. This was a red Okay. But you do get that benefit. So it's a great yeah. sort of, um, it's a win win, really. Yeah. yeah. And, and it makes a cleaner product to use as well. You know, you're not standing there in a white cloud of smoke, sort of, yep. trying to chomp through a trees. Yeah. yeah. From from a contractor point of view, we've had a lot of positive feedback in mm. that saw. Yeah. Um, particularly the, the power to weight ratio. And also, to, it's quite narrow. So you get less. Nice. Um, like gyro forces on the operator. So it's yeah. Nice. Yep. Which is which is really good. Um, mm. But yeah, it is it, it is a very large saw. Um, yep. So yeah, for specialists. Yeah. So for most of my audience, there'll be some that will go for a big saw like that. I actually I've got a big saw in my arsenal, but it doesn't get used very often. The, the saws that I use the most, and other contractors will use, is sort of a mid-sized saw for doing logs that are up to one or two feet in diameter. And then the most common one that I see being used, and I've got the um, five forty top handle battery saw. So that has been. A game changer for me. I went from a petrol top handle saw to the 540, and it was a different brand petrol saw. <laughs> I won't mention it, <laughs> but um, yeah. But going to the battery saw, now pull it out, switch it on. It's got all the safety features there, which is really good. And the fact that the chain isn't moving until you actually pull the trigger it makes it safer than a petrol saw. I've had one person that I've spoken to in the last two years which said that actually makes them feel unsafe because it's so easy and confidence inspiring that they feel like it's just easier to end up doing something dangerous. But overall, I say that's a massive benefit in safety going to a battery saw. And the 540, comparing to similar petrol saws, and I think you've got a 540 that is a petrol, right? We do, yeah. So power output comparison between the two, would you say it's pretty similar? They're very close, yeah. 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 And that's something that we try to do with um, all of our battery products. We try to make sure the performance is as close as it can be to, to its sort of petrol. If it has one, yeah, so. yeah fair yeah. enough. So it's a, about forty cc's of performance in a battery product. Yep. 
And I've noticed with Husqvarna, your product range is measured in things like that. So the five series product range is where we're speaking to most of the lawn contractors. And not a lot of them will buy the three series or the one series machines. Um, and then with the five series, like the, the whipper snipper I've talked about endlessly because I've used them for the last five years is the 520. Yes. And that is a comparable to a 20cc whipper snipper. I get complaints from other people there, like it feels a little bit underpowered. And I'm like, okay, you're comparing it to a 25cc petrol machine probably. Whereas the 20cc comparison, I'm going to say it's got enough power for everyday routine maintenance on lawns that are kept tidy. And it gives you a massive run time. So most people will be sitting there going, yeah, I don't want to go to battery because I'm going to get a half hour run time on a battery. That 520 ILX, <laughs> the first one of those I bought wasn't actually a 520. It was the earlier battery model range, but still was basically the same machine. And with the BLI 300 battery and that, I could get over two hours run time. Yeah. There's no other whippersnipper that's battery powered I've found that gets that sort of run time on and is powerful enough to do that maintenance work. Well, yeah, yeah. Look, that's the general feedback we get as well. We have released some more powerful battery line trims, yes, as well, based off that. So there's the five two five ILK, which is uh, that's fairly digital. new. Yep. So that's jumped about twenty percent in power. Yeah. And there's also a dedicated line trim of the five two five I, which is it I IRX, which is sounds just right. a straight sharp. Yeah. Um, which gives operators more power as well. Yeah. So that we, we design those um, more powerful tools based on a lot of feedback we have from contractors. Now, I'm not familiar with the runtime on those ones, but I'm guessing it's going to sacrifice a little bit of runtime in order to get that extra power. But I'm told, I did an interview a couple of weeks ago with Darren from Batmo in Victoria. I think you guys both know him. Yeah. And he was saying that the runtime's have improved with the newer models so that the, the 525 with the 300 battery and it's still going to do a fairly impressive runtime. For sure. Yeah. I think it, from memory, I think he said it was around 45 minutes plus. Yeah, so runtimes are very interesting. Yes. Uh, <laughs> thing to talk about because it's also dependent on application yeah. um, and also, you know, how you're using the tool. So, for example, a lot of the machines have an economy mode. Yeah. So if you're only you know, knocking down light grass or on a property the contractor's maintaining a lot. Yeah. It's not going to go through a battery as quick yeah. as something that's, you know, not been used as frequent on a lawn. Yep. Or the grass is really, you know, knee height. It's going to chew up a lot more. Yeah. Um, a lot more of the battery capacity. Yeah. Um, the other the other big thing that's not spoken about a lot is the actual diameter of the line. Yeah. So if, that's actually really important for a battery tool. So we, we would recommend, say, around that 2.4 mil. Yep. So once you go over that, it can actually, you know, cause the performance to drop. Yes. So. I've um, spoken on this numerous occasions, and the Lawn Mowing Contractors Australia group on Facebook, mm. this topic comes up all the time. What's the best whippersnipper line to use? And because I'm using the 520 quite a lot, and I compare that to the Ego STX 4500, which I also have in my arsenal, even though they're not the same in terms of power or use, um, they're, they're what I've got. So I talk about both of those. And the 520 uh, is recommended to use 2 mil line. And so I've got a lot of 2 mil line and I've found that the Husqvarna branded Whisper Twist line in the 520 is the smoothest, um, less vibrations than any of the other 2 mil lines that I've used, which means with that particular product, getting that two hour runtime, getting really good performance out of it and cutting really crisp edges with 2 mil cord as well. Yeah. So that, that's something most contractors just can't stand the idea of going down to 2 mil cord. Where if you go up to the 525 IRX, I believe, that's where you're saying the 2.4 mil cord is good in that one. Yeah, yeah. So you can have large, large cord. Obviously, you've got a more powerful motor, um, but obviously the thicker the cord gets, the more energy the tools that are used to actually keep it tuned. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense and a lot of contractors are going to need to get their head around that with battery tools 
your runtime and your power efficiency are going to be best matched when you actually stick to the recommendations from the manufacturer. And that goes to a favourite topic of contractors that remove the whippersnapper guard. <laughs> oh, yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a no-no. Yes, it, it is a no-no, right? And a lot of contractors have had this argument over time. It's, you know, who's it hurting? It's not hurting anybody. There's no insurance or no government regulations that stipulate you have to have the guard on, so what does it matter? And I believe with battery tools, it actually makes a lot more difference than with petrol tools in terms of the load it puts on the motor. Um, there's the obvious things, right, like safety. If you're working on a commercial site and you're filling out SWIMS documents, it says in there you've got to have the guards on your machines. If you don't have the guards on your machines, sorry, you don't meet the requirements for a commercial site. <laughs> yeah. But a lot of people working on residential sites, they'll just pull them off anyway. Uh, I, I would say in the lawn contractor community, most whippersnippers, particularly petrol, don't have the guards on. And it's only more recently when the discussion about motors dying from being overloaded with battery ones that people are starting to go, oh, okay, maybe I should leave it on. Yeah. Well, something we didn't mention too about the 520i was um, the fact that it's reversible. Yes. So one of the things I often see is contractors posting about smash windows. Yeah. So, you know, you can reverse, so you're throwing the material away from from a window. Yep. So, um, I actually use a 520 at home. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I basically will throw the material away from a window. Yes. So. I, um, when I bought the original version of the 520, that was one of the features that got me over the line was the fact that you could change the direction if you're cutting into a corner, you can cut into a corner better from one direction than another. And small hack on this one, most contractors are used to the contractor style machines that run anti-clockwise, whereas the 520 standard direction is clockwise, not anti-clockwise. So I run mine in reverse all the time. I feed the head accordingly so that it will bump feed naturally when it's running in reverse. And um, that way... The majority of the time I'm running it in a direction that's the same as any other tool I would use and then I switch directions. Like you say, if you're trying to avoid throwing rocks at cars or windows, those sorts of things. I was just training an employee this week, it might have been last week, and pointed out to them that if you look at the direction the cord spins, when you're swinging a whippersnapper um, left to right or right to left it will throw the grass in opposite directions it'll either throw it towards you and the guard protects you or it'll throw it away from you and potentially throw it straight into windows and cars and things like that so yeah it's a feature which does require a little bit of training to actually think about mm. yeah sure yeah. yeah okay so welcome back again Andrew you touched on something a little bit earlier in terms of we're talking about run times and the batteries that Husqvarna have um, with we've got a lot of technology in batteries I'm always happy to talk about technology I geek out on it a fair bit but um, the comparison between run time and power output and batteries have a massive trade-off compared to petrol tools where the petrol tool is designed to have say a one kilowatt engine in it and your runtime will vary a little bit if you've got full throttle versus idle, but your battery runtime can change drastically from a two hour runtime on a 520 down to I've flattened the battery in almost 10 minutes by using that machine out of context and trying to do really heavy work with it. Yeah, look, that's, that's a really good point, and it also varies depending on what machine you're using. So, yeah, a lot of contractors uh, jump in a battery with. Yes, yeah. That's the gateway drug for battery. Yes, <laughs> yeah, because you get really run time and um, obviously you're not holding the trigger down the whole time. Yeah. So a lot of contractors tell me they get all day out of the 5, five amp hour battery. Yeah. So, which is really good feedback. Um, yep. But then, yeah, on the flip side, if they're using it in a blower and then doing really heavy work, you can drain a battery really quickly. Yes, yeah, now I've, I've had a couple of Husqvarna battery blowers and mm. loves them. Um, they do go through the battery a lot quicker than a hedge trimmer. So, that, I mean, that's across the board. Yep. But I've found with contractors, when they go to a battery-powered hedge trimmer, the blower is the next favourite tool, even though it's got a really low runtime by comparison. Yep. So I know hedge trimming 
with a battery hedger and Husqvarna has been my biggest experience there. I've got extensive experience with Ego as well, but the Husqvarna with a 9.4 amp, so the BLI 300, yep. I think trigger time is somewhere around five hours and most people are not on the trigger all day. So there you go, you, you sort of get up to a full day runtime with that particular setup and I'm, I've used the short pole hedger for that. Done a lot of topiary work, a lot of balls and a lot of head, not straight hedges and yeah, you can just go, go, go with those machines. Mm. Um, going back to the whipper snippers, the dedicated whip snippers, I noticed we've talked a lot about the 520, mm. but the 525 that is fairly new on the market at the moment is very similar to the 325 that's been out on the market for almost two years now. I think it has been two years. Yep. So they're very comparable to each other, the 325 and the 525, but they're completely different to the 520. And one of those things was the position of the motor. Yes, correct. Um, 520's got the motor down the on the cutting head, yep. whereas the other ones have the motor up on the handle, behind the handle. Yep. Um, going across those, you start moving into more powerful options as well if you're going in brush cutting. And people often don't want to go back through when they're brush cutting because of their run times. Mm. But they, you've got a full range of brush cutting options with battery power. Yeah, look, there's a couple of reasons we've we've put the motor at the the end of the tool. Yep. Because um, particularly some of the contractors tell us it's better to have more weight. Yes. Than using it vertically up up the top. Yep. Um, and uh, some of the people don't like the weight down the bottom. So yeah, that's probably the main reason. And obviously having weight. Or well, the motor at the bottom of the tool actually increases efficiency. Yes. So you get longer run time, but yep. yeah, not everyone likes that design. So we're catering for both. Yeah. Um, probably the main difference with the 525 ILK to the 325, which a lot of contractors use, it's mainly um, water ingress protection. Yeah. And, and overall sort of build quality. Yeah. So it's really sort of geared towards people that are going to be using it multiple yes. hours each day. I see a lot of those tools attached to the outside of a trailer on an equipment defender rack or something to that effect. And they're out in the weather 24-7. Yeah. <laughs> so the 525 is going to do a better job. Um, the IP rating, I think the initial IP ratings are different because you've got two numbers, right? So one number is talking about dust ingress, one's talking about water ingress. Is that, am I rough off the charts or am I right? <laughs> well, yeah, when you talk about electric motors, that's correct. Yeah. So I think probably the most important thing um, that can get overlooked, if you've got a battery tool on the back of a trailer or outside um, and you don't have a battery in it, leaving the fuel cap off a, a petrol tool, you really so have you're a, exposing it to more. Yeah. So it's yeah. the terminals being exposed, which yeah. is a big risk. So yep. when, when the battery's in there, you've got your IP protection. Yeah. But when it's not in there, you're exposing the tool to risk. So yep. um, that's something to look at. And obviously on the flip side too, if you're putting a, a tool into storage for a long time, yep. it's in, like, a contractor wouldn't necessarily do that, but it's yeah. important to take your batteries out as well because yep. you can get slow discharges. I, I have a 520 that has a burnt out terminal from where the battery connector is and then possibly could be caught by dust ingress and then the yeah on the terminal something along those lines but it it had done a lot of work <laughs> yeah. yeah but it is really important for contractors to keep the terminals clean no matter what yeah and they're using yes so uh, and that would apply to to the charges as well yeah so sure and i think as well like when we're talking about servicing of battery products um there's kind of the I think unspoken perspective that they don't really need a lot. Yeah, um, servicing is going to clean the, the dealer will clean out the inside of the product and they'll do things like check the terminals and make sure they're in good condition and they've not sort of suffered any corrosion or anything like that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's good to service them too. Yes. Yeah, most people think, and one of the selling points of battery is you don't have to worry about servicing like you do with petrol. Maybe. Not as frequently, but yeah, it's definitely still good to pop into the dealership. Every yeah, time. for sure. Yeah, I've um, got a fairly good relationship with Tinks Mowers up in Newcastle. Uh, Tom Benson has 
made it his business to service contractors more so than home users. And yeah, I've found that particularly when it comes to the Husqvarna gear up there, he knows his stuff mm. and he's good at getting things sorted out. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, the, the dealers can actually whip out software that can connect the battery tools as well as petrol tools and, and yeah. diagnostics. They yep. can see what temperatures batteries have got to Interesting. run hours on the machines. Yeah. So they can, they can look at certain things which can help diagnose if, if, if there's an issue potentially or yeah. something that could be improved performance wise. So I've got a battery that's dated 2018. <laughs> if I took that into Tom and said, hey, Tom, have, have a look at the history of this battery. It could be interesting. Yeah, so, <laughs> so one of the obvious things would be battery cycles. Yes. So we like to talk about for a commercial battery, 1500 cycles yep. for a residential battery, it would be around 600 cycles. So interesting. Yeah. Once you go over that 1500 cycles, the capacity of the battery actually starts to get less and less. If you start talking too much battery tech, I'm going to be stuck here talking till mid midnight because I, I love that stuff. But uh, yeah, that's it. that is really interesting. The number of cycles that you expect out of different batteries, and mm. yeah, I guess that comes down to the chemistry of the batteries and manufacturing qualities, all those things, right? Mm. For sure, yeah. Yeah, and look, for a contractor, when we talk about a cycle, it's basically a full full charge and then a full discharge. So yeah. Now let's geek out on that for a second. I was talking to somebody else about this with um, vehicle batteries because a lot of people are switching to a second battery in a vehicle for doing their charging on the run. And somebody had an issue with one of their second batteries in their vehicle getting low on voltage and then they couldn't charge it. And I said, oh, you don't get that problem with your tools, do you? He used Makita tools as a uh, chippy. And I was saying, you know, Husqvarna tools, Makita tools, all those battery tools that you use... What they classify as a charge cycle is really important, so a full charge cycle. But the second thing is that the batteries in your tools have a protection in them so that they don't get overcharged or over-discharged. Yes. Correct, yes. Correct. Yeah. So, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot more we could dive into there when we start talking about lithium and the various types of lithium batteries, all those sorts of things. But let's keep it more general interest. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll, we'll geek out too much. Um, so we, we were talking about quite a few of the tools there now. Um, I wanted to bounce back across some of the other outdoor power equipment that you guys, that Husqvarna specialises in, because you've got a full range of outdoor power equipment. Not many brands do that. I don't, I don't know of any other brand that does everything from your zero turns through to all of your handheld tools and, and a good range of battery tools in there. Um, I'd love to see when you're bringing out a battery powered zero turn, but let's talk about commercial quality zero turns and I think the other one that I see contractors using which I'm surprised by but makes sense is the rider range yep. so in the zero turns obviously contractors will buy cheap ones all the way through to the most expensive ones but there is a range that's commercial there is yep. and I've I've actually bought a new ride on mail recently and so I looked at Husqvarna and I looked at Wright and I looked at Skang and I looked at Walker because I've been a massive Walker fan for years okay. um, but the top of the line Husqvarna zero turns can you help me with the model number there because I think it's like a 554 does that sound right yep so we've got three 500 series uh, zero turns in the range so yeah the 554L yeah the Z560 and the Z572 Okay, so the, the last two numbers in those models indicate the deck size. So a 54, a 60 inch and a 72 inch. So, and they're all basically the same machine apart from the deck size. Um, so there are some differences between the three models. Yeah. Um, especially once you get to the 72. Yeah, more power? More power, That's yeah. good to know. Yes. <laughs> so the engine sizes do differ depending on the deck specification. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're all the 500 series zero turn family. Yep. They're all very, very uh, overbuilt for commercial use. Now, talking to a couple of different manufacturers, Simon, you, you're the right person in Husqvarna to have this discussion with. Other manufacturers will argue over power versus efficiency when it comes to these size machines. So, you know, the most powerful 54 or 52-inch machines, 60-inch machines are often up around the 36 through to 40 horsepower range. And yeah. then the more efficient ones it might be, say, a 27 horse. Um, and that comparison between having outright power and maximum efficiency will make a difference if you're doing, say, overgrown jobs with them or regular maintenance. 
Um, Husqvarna's got to have done a lot of research into this. How do they sit in that? Are they, like, power output, are they made to sort of balance that or are they favouring one way or the other? It's a very good question. Um, so, I mean, so, for example, the 572X, I believe, has an FX921. Yeah. Kawasaki. So yeah. definitely in the sort of very upper end of the, of the power Kawasaki of the yeah. engines. Yep. Um, as far as efficiency versus sheer power, um, I believe it's a, it's a balancing act. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. I, I tell people, if you're using a zero turn or a stander to cut grass that's six foot tall, maybe go and invest in a tractor and a slasher instead. Yes, yeah. But people will still do it. Correct, yeah. And I mean, look, that's something that we do come across. Um, it's kind of the product versus the application. Yeah. So if you're in a paddock and you've got six foot tall sort of grass and native grasses and things like that, yeah. um, that is very much a, a slasher style um, job that you need to be doing. Now, you guys have got a product that meets that market well too. You've got the, the Rider P525 with the uh, flail slasher you can put on it. We do, yeah. So we offer a flail. So that, that's an interesting product. I looked at that years ago when I was working with walkers and I was like, I need a bigger machine that's more powerful for tackling those overgrown jobs. A walker is not the right machine for doing overgrown grass, even though it can do it. Just what we were saying before, that balance between power and efficiency means that most of these mowers are designed for mowing or finished mowing, whereas the that rider, the P525, is capable and built and designed to do some of those overgrown jobs with the flail deck on it. Or Now, you said there was a couple of different attachments for that one. There is, yeah. So we've got the flail deck, and then we've got two different uh, combi decks. So yep. those are essentially either rear discharge or mulching, yep. um, depending on how you want to configure it. Yeah. Uh, we've also got a bucket attachment for it. Yep. We've got a leaf, like a bristle brush. Okay. Is so that good for sweeping paths? Yep. Yeah. That's a, I believe that's a passive attachment, so there's no sort of use of the engine power. It's just essentially you latch it onto the front as you drive uh, the bristles. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. So there's quite a few different options there. Now, with the multi-decks on that, and compared to your zero turns, in, in the commercial range, most mowers run a fabricated deck because it's a lot stronger than a pressed deck. But I think your multi-decks on the riders are a pressed deck. They are a pressed deck. And... There's only one other manufacturer I know that makes commercial quality press decks, that being John Deere, which they're legendary for having their, I think it's a seven iron, they call it. Oh, yes. So yeah, press yeah. decks. And I I love a good pressed deck. It gets me going. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, the airflow is way better. Yeah. Than press deck. It's just yeah, by design. So I can imagine jumping on one of your riders that's got a pressed deck. The quality of cut when you're mulching is going to be a lot better than what you'll get with some other commercial machines. For sure, yeah. I mean, look, the press deck on the P525DX and the P524, they are very much a commercial-style press deck, so they're very, very thick steel. Yeah. Um, so it's not sort of... You kind of get some of the benefits of a fabricated deck um, yeah. in a press deck. Yep. Uh, fabricated decks are very much sort of focused at uh, rougher conditions they're a lot more yeah robust because of the way that they're constructed they're, they're made to take a beating and most contractors love to give them a beating yes indeed <laughs> yes yeah most yeah. but i i notice and we won't spend too much time on this i want to get over to andrew and oh, both of you i guess talking about automowers in a minute but the difference between pressed and bennel decks and fabricated decks also comes into play when you're talking about the difference between zero turns versus out front machines and the riders really are comparable to an out front machine where you're talking John Deere, um, Kubota and Iseki they are all and I, there's a couple of other brands but we, yeah they're all focused on out front machines so the the rider series really gets some of the advantages of an out front machine in terms of the deck floats across the land follows the slopes better than a zero turn will. Correct, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of benefits to having the deck out the front of the operator. Yeah. Um, most of them are visibility, so you can see exactly what you're mowing. Yep. Uh, Maneuverability, so, you know, you can kind of steer that the front deck around and get under things like benches and under trees because yeah. you're not having to get the whole product under there. You can get the deck under there. Yep. Um, yeah, so, and I mean, 
with riders. Um, I know, like, for example, you said the John Deere. I believe they're like a rear steer. So they're maybe closer yes. to like a... I think, like I think the Kubota is too. The, the Iseki might be as well. Okay. So the P525DX is uh, an articulated mower. So yeah. there, there isn't actually any um, steering input into the wheels. Yeah. What you're doing is you're turning the, the center of the machine. So the machine pivots as you steer. Yep. Um, it takes a little bit, sort of, you know, five minutes, ten minutes to kind of get a feel for how it behaves. Yeah. Um, but it is very intuitive. Are they all-wheel drive as well? They're all-wheel drive. Yeah. yeah, a lot of so, a lot of our front machines are all wheel drive, and gives you the benefit of working on slopes, more traction. Yeah, that, that's an interesting product range. A lot of contractors won't ever touch a out front machine, but they are they meet a really good market in terms of what they do. And the contractors I've seen that use the Husqvarna Rider series, they swear by them. Yes, I was going to say it's very similar to the auto mower. Yeah, um, a lot of contractors will be comfortable with zero turns and things like that. Yep. And they try, you know, an out-the-front mower. And they're, you know, at the beginning, maybe they're thinking, well, I mean, the zero turn was, was really good. Yeah. Um, but after a couple of weeks of, of using it, they won't go back. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I told you guys before we hit record that I wouldn't push you for new product information. So I'm going to spring this one on you. <laughs> 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 talking, talking specifically about zero turns, riders, and the... Um, standards that Husqvarna have brought into Australia. I believe that at the moment the standards are no longer being offered in Australia. It's not totally true. So we still have some in stock. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So the yeah. B548 and the 554. So what I'm pushing for is, is there a new model coming out soon? <laughs> <laughs> hmm, that's actually, that's a good question. Uh, uh, good good spot to watch and see what might come along. I, I've recently started using standards and that's why I'm interested in that space because going back to what we're talking about, the difference between a zero turn and a rider, you get different advantages and then you get different advantages going to a standard as well. So the, the standard market gets the advantage that you've got a lot of visibility because you're up taller and also a bit of um, extra advantage with being able to move your weight around quickly on a stander. For sure. Um, I, I looked closely at the current Husqvarna standards because I like the design they've come up with um, in terms of where they position the motor, how the hydraulics come off the motor and where they sit. Those various different features have been an interesting design by comparison to other standard options. And I think the only other brand that stands out there with where they place things is Wright, which is what I've been using recently. So, yeah, interesting features. So it's a space to watch. Hopefully I'll see something there. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you find there's improved ergonomics with the standard compared to City? So... I've used Walker extensively, which is comparable to an out front machine. I've used a lot of zero turns and now I've got experience on the standards. And I'm going to say that it comes down to um, things like, do you have a sore back? If getting old, like Andrew, you're probably similar. No, actually, you're younger than me. <laughs> I'm the oldest person in the room. I'm the oldest person in the room. I've got some back pain. I've also got some knee pain. So if I sit down on a zero turn or an out front machine, after about three hours of the same thing, I'm going to get a little bit sore and stiff in the back. Uh, standing on a stander for three hours, my ankles or my knees start to get a little bit sore or stiff. So, you know, if you've got two beside each other, the ideal thing is to spend half an hour on one and then a half hour on the other and back and forth in between. Yes, there are some advantages other than just those things, but um, ergonomics-wise... I think each of those have some advantages. And I actually said this recently to somebody else that ideally it would be good to have both so you can just swap in between. And I'm working in a space where it's commercial work, where you can literally be on a machine for three or four hours or you can be on a whippersnapper for three or four hours. So the correct safety procedures in those situations is to make sure you change jobs regularly to avoid problems. Does that answer your question, Andrew? Yeah, I guess where I'm coming from, I think there are benefits to standing as yeah. opposed to being sitting on your blessed assurance yes. um, too long. So um, obviously you're going to take some of the shock through your, through your knees, yes. um, which could for some people be beneficial. When yeah, definitely. Yeah. But yeah, each to their own. Some people will struggle with physical ailments that will mean they will lead one way or another. Mm. Other people 
you know, it's preference. And I see a lot of people being swayed by social media at the moment. Everybody's got a standard, so everybody wants a standard. And then you see a lot of them come up for sale all of a sudden when they go, oh, I'm going to go back to using something else. But they, the standards do offer some distinct advantages there. One of those you just mentioned with the shock absorption through your legs makes mm. makes it a lot better on rough areas. But if you're doing a lot of rough areas, you might look at something like a Ferris where it's got suspension all round. Or you might go to something that's got bigger wheels so that it doesn't bounce as much over those areas. Mm. I mean, look, the 500 series zero turns we were speaking about earlier. Yeah. They've all got very, very nice uh, suspension seats. So you can tune yeah. it to sort of your, your comfort level. Yep. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it sort of really depends, depends on what you're looking to get, get out, of the, the, out of the product. I, I did a uh, graveyard for three or four years. And I was there weekly mowing that graveyard. And they had a ferris on site. And I used my walker, but I occasionally would use their ferris. And you could go full speed with the ferris across the lawn cemetery. Don't tell anyone who lives in the cemetery there, but you're going full speed across <laughs> these graves, bounce, 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 and sitting on the suspension is just smooth. You get occasional bump that gets through, but most of it's pretty smooth. On the walker, you're sitting above the drive wheels, which are the biggest wheels. So you go up and down a bit more, but because you're on the drive wheels, it's fairly smooth. I did a couple of demos on other zero turns and they were horrendous for those bumps that you get as you go across a new grave or an old grave where it's a mound or a hollow. (laughs) So yeah, it makes a massive difference. And like you say, having a good suspension seat would be the only way to deal with some of the zero turn options there. So especially, you know, if you're on it all day, yeah, or most of the day, yeah, it's, it's a good investment. It's something with a nice suspension seat for sure. Yeah, make a big difference. So, I, I guess, guess that's that, one of the reasons I looked pretty extensively at the Husqvarna Zero Turns is because their standard set of features is pretty high for a very competitive price. Yeah. yeah. So we've had a short break. Welcome back, guys. We have covered some interesting products so far, and we're going to dive into the auto mower range now. I, I love talking about robots, so, you know, you'll have to hold me back from geeking out on them, but I think you guys are going to be the same, right? <laughs> yeah. Very much. Yeah. Yep. Robotics guys. I keep saying this, my listeners are contractors, so we keep on trying to frame the interview to be interesting to contractors, and this is going to be a little bit more challenging with the automobile range, but there are a number of contractors that message me about robots from time to time, either some that are using them, like the interview I did two weeks ago with Darren from Batmo, um, or other people who are going, oh, what do you reckon about this property? You reckon we could do a robot on this? So we're going to try and encourage more people to think about using robots in their commercial sites and residential properties they look after by talking about this. Husqvarna have the biggest or best product range in robotic mowers, and there are other robots that I like outside of the Husqvarna range. I won't try and cause you guys to sweat too much talking about all the other brands, but we can mention some. It's it's not taboo to mention them. We just try not to get too competitive. <laughs> yeah, look, from my perspective, it's actually a good thing. Yeah. More brands coming into the market and increases the awareness. Yes. We've been uh, designing or manufacturing robots since 1995, so yeah, it's actually a good thing competition. Yeah. But yeah, we, we've obviously got technology they don't have and they've got some we don't have. So yeah. it's um, a lot of it comes down to the application. Yes. As well as to what's going to be more suitable. Yeah, So for sure. We probably touch on that as well. Yeah. Well, I want to touch on a couple of different things here. And one of the comparisons I've talked about in previous podcast episodes is that if you look at a different brand of product for robotic mowers and we could mention some names it won't hurt if we do mention some names but i'm not going to throw them under the bus right now so let's just go brand x as a robot that is cheap and good value we could speculate over whether they are poor quality and they're not going to last long but either which way for any of those brands or products available from other brands Husqvarna likely has a product that is comparable in the product range. So I find myself saying, okay, if you look at, say, the new Husqvarna Aspire, that meets the same market as a number of other brands that are comparable in price or maybe slightly cheaper than the Aspire. Um, I'm constantly telling people, if you want to buy a robot and you can go, all right, there's a product for $1,000, brand X, there's a Husqvarna for correct me on the price, I think it's 1300 and 
$13.99. Spend an extra $400 over Brand X and you've got product that is comparable in terms of its capacity and design qualities, but it's got the brand Husqvarna backing it. Yeah, 100%. So that, that Aspire for products designed for someone to be able to install themselves. Yes. And very much so on a simple flat area. So, yeah. you know, small capacity up to 600 square meters. Yeah. Um, I guess the main differentiator when you would compare that product to some of the other brands is probably the app that Husqvarna have in terms yeah. of being quite intuitive. And also to local support, not only through the dealer network, but also uh, through Husqvarna. So you've got the tech support team, product managers and robotic sales specialists that yeah. support the dealer network. Yeah. Now, my first interview with Husqvarna is dating back two years and probably about four weeks. <laughs> um, did it with Phil Esterman and I released it, I think, around Christmas time two years ago. So that's why I'm saying, but yeah. Maybe maybe six weeks, <laughs> yeah. and, but that's that's why I remember because it was very close on Christmas when I released the episode. Um, we talked about that those sorts of issues that you just mentioned there, Andrew. That's why I'm referring to that. And looking at over time, Husqvarna has, like you say, we've got a range of people involved from installers to your local Husqvarna shop where you can buy outdoor power equipment, um, dedicated dealers that specialise in robotics. Um, and across the whole country, you've got a Husqvarna dealer near you. Yep. Uh, I've looked at several different brands of robots. I've played with several different brands of robots, and some of them are quite good. And in some cases, don't kill me for saying this, I might wreck a brand, another brand other than Husqvarna for one reason or another. But Husqvarna do have a product that meets every market need for robotics. The auto mowers do. And the, there's some new ones that have come out recently. I know we talked about the Aspire already. That's a pretty recent one on the market. Um, last time I looked, the auto mower range was going from the 305 through to the 535. And the 430 and the 450 are probably two of the more well-known ones in that range. Yeah. So now we've got a much larger range. Can we either of you jump in and answer this? The product range covers different needs. So let's look at what those are, break it up into a couple of different categories, if that's all right. Sure. Yeah. So I guess if you, if you break up the types of properties, we, we often talk about homeowners and landowners. Yeah. yeah. So we've got products designed small blocks. Yes. You know, and let's face it, a lot of blocks in metropolitan areas are getting smaller and smaller. Yeah. So a lot of those small products like Aspire, R4, 305s, 310s, yep. 405s, even the design for those really, really small blocks. And then you've got yep. larger products like the 430X, 450X. Yes. Which, you know, can mow up to an acre property. Yeah. So I've had a pretty close interaction with a 430X and yeah, it's certainly, I think that one goes up to about three quarters of an acre. The 450 goes over an acre yes. at its maximum capacity. Um, and they're very versatile machines, those compared to other brands in that space, those yes. machines offer features that I think are not found in competitors. Yeah, look, a hundred percent. They're probably, if you look at those products, our heroes in the range. Yeah. They're very reliable. Um, they come with all the bells and whistles. And, yeah, yeah we get really good feedback from from, from customers. Um, the, the 430 and the 450 are eventually going to be replaced. Yeah. Um, so we've got a new era range. Yeah. It's come in. So the difference between the... 430X, 450X, and the new NERAs that come out. It, um, there's massive update in terms of the software and the engineering behind them. But I think the interesting thing for me is the add-on with the EPOS now. Yeah, 100%. I think when you look at the NERA range, what's interesting compared to other products that use RTK technology or wireless products, yeah, you can actually install the NERA machine as a wired machine or as an EPOS. There's a lot of advantages in that, isn't there? 
Yeah, look, 100%. Um, one thing we're finding in the market, a lot of people are quick to jump onto the RTK technology and yes. it's not always suitable for, for yeah. people's lawns. So, yeah. you know, someone might be, the neighbour might have a really big tree that blocks the signals in their yard and, yeah, yeah people are rushing out and buying RTK products yeah. where they may not be suitable for for a property. So... Um, Hasana's deliberately designed it to be able to work as both as they phase out some of the older, older products. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah okay. So the advantage is there and I've, I've played with both wired systems and wireless robotic systems. Mm. Um, the wired systems typically are promoted as being a more secure system because it's got a hard barrier in the edge of the property where the, where the area that's been made, if the robot gets to that physical barrier, mm. it has a lot of safeties built in place so that it won't go further. Whereas with an RTK based robot, mm. it's relying on that position being located by GPS. Yeah. So essentially the, the RTK um, robotic mowers are connected to several satellites. Yeah. And then you have, uh, we call it a reference station, but GPS enhancer that sends Correctional data to them, so yeah. um, you know you can have things, like a, um, a solar storm that could pr- pr- potentially um, block satellites. So, whereas the wide mowers that we have, if you look at the four hundred and thirty and the four hundred and fifty X, they are GPS assisted, so they're connected to satellites, but yeah. they don't solely rely on it. Yep. So for a lot of applications that is the best technology yeah um but you know in the future as it improves that might swing or swing around the other way so with rtk gps mm. um lots of fancy acronyms there so um, real-time kinematics yeah excellent <laughs> I, I was gonna try to regurgitate that, mm. but i won't i'll leave that for the experts um I like to give people the dumb version. So if you can imagine a triangle, you can measure very accurately from a triangle. If you've got two reference points and then a robot, that and for the arguments of GPS, you don't just have two reference points. You've got like 16 GPS um, satellites running around in the sky at any one point in time. So that should improve the accuracy. But because those satellites are, what are they, like 10,000 kilometres away? Your, your reference station is more like, up to 500 metres away from the robot. So it helps to increase that accuracy by an extra triangle in the mix that's close by the robot. It does. Yeah, and we can actually reference station. I like that. Yeah, as a repeater. So basically, as you install, so the further the mower gets away from the charging station, you can introduce more reference stations around corners and things like that. Now, I'm going to warn users on this. If you've got a robot that can do 5,000 square metres, which the, I think the 450X is in that range, um, and you go, okay, it's going to do one area that's very neat and uniform, 5,000 square metres, it's easy for it to manage. Mm. But if you're going to say, all right, I've got two acres and I want to do a total of 5,000 square metres, but it's a patch here and a patch there and a patch there. Yes, you can have a couple of reference stations or several reference stations to cover those areas. Um, that robot's going to operate at its most efficient when it's doing one area. And then as you spread it across those multiple areas, it's got to spend a lot of time driving in between areas and um, it's less efficient on small areas than it is on one big area. So there's a lot of factors that come into understanding this and you really are best off talking to a robot specialist to work out if that's a suitable option for you. Yeah, look, that's a really good point you've raised there. Um, the actual capacity of the depends on a lot of factors. Yeah. So if you've got a, a big open rectangle, the mower is going to be easily able to cover maximum capacity. Yes. If you've got a really complex lawn with lots of curves and lots of islands and areas that it can't go, yep. um, particularly if it's capacity can drop. So you, yes. if, if it's ultra complex, capacity could actually drop to 50%. Yeah. So so when we're specifying robotic mowers or property, we like to over-specify the mower. Yep. And if you look at gra- grass growth conditions at the moment, the extreme, Yep. so you always want to have that redundancy built into a machine to catch up. Yes. 
So I think it's really important to talk about that. Yeah, I think 5,000 square meters is mm. absolutely kind of like Andrew was saying, a mm. nice big rectangle, or yeah. flat. I've heard it referred to as a circle is actually the best, <laughs> perfect option for a robot that's doing one big area. <laughs> yeah. Particularly yeah. on random cut. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and it also varies depending on what grass you're cutting as yes. well. So we all know IQ has <laughs> gone crazy. And it doesn't grow uniformly, whereas buffalo is very uniform. Yeah. But it, it's interesting. IQ is actually really easy to cut yes. for a robotic mower yeah. compared to say in Azoises and varieties yeah. of pooch. Yep. That mm. raises another point. I'm sorry, but it, like, we, we're all geeking out on this stuff. But if you start cutting different types of grass, you find robots actually work at their most efficient when they're cutting grass reasonably short. So I think with Husqvarna, you set, set this up. I, I believe it's between 25 millimetres and about 80 millimetres in height options. Is that on the product, yeah. 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 So between yeah. 60 and 20. So yeah, it's, it's I see people regularly going for the middle range there, around the 40 millimetre mark, maybe 50 millimetres, and I keep on telling them it'll look better and it'll work better if you cut down around 25 to 35 millimetres. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, look, 100%. And you essentially you're almost training the grass not to grow upright yeah. as much and it yes. becomes thicker. So. Yeah, people who are been trained on golf courses will appreciate that. If you cut grass short, you've got to cut it daily. You, if you're out there cutting a golf green, you cut it daily. If you miss a day, then you're actually adversely affecting the turf on the green. Mm. And so a robot mower really works best when it's in the same area. A lot of contractors will go, oh, why don't, why don't I buy a couple of robot mowers and put them in my trailer and take it around and it can mow this property on Monday and that one on Tuesday. And <laughs> it's like, no, the the best quality you get from a robot mower is when it's in one area cutting seven days a week. Mm. Yes. And it, particularly if you're cutting short, then it does train that grass, like you're saying, like a golf course or a golf green. And yes. the lawns I have seen that are cut routinely by robot mowers, I like the random cut because you look at it and it just looks perfect all the time whereas when you start going to some of the options with rtk mowers that mm. cut systematically people like the stripes i, I prefer the random cut <laughs> yeah yeah i think the efficiency goes way up um so with our 500 series epos machine yeah casting yeah. it cutting in systematic um yes but yeah i mean look the random mowing uh, uh, protocol is the go-to on on all the domestic machines yep and it does a great job yeah, yeah it really does yeah, and if they've got a really complex lawn too with lots of garden beds and things, random mowing it actually works more efficiently. Yeah, I've noticed that. I've, yeah. I've tested a couple of robots that are working systematically mm. and if they don't have a good algorithm built in, when they get to tight, confined spaces, they spend four or five times as long working in those narrow areas than what they do in open areas. Yeah, look, when we talk about the RTK technology, or we call it EPOS, we like yes. to talk about open, big open space. That's where they're most efficient. Uh, yeah, especially at the moment until the technology gets better. So yeah, um, there are improvements coming all the time. Um, so when we first launched uh, EPOS technology, I think the mower needed a 110 degree view of the sky. Yeah. And then that's gone down to 90 degree view of the sky. That's so a big improvement. Yeah. yeah, so that's probably in about a 12-month, 18-month period. Yeah, and I've noticed that with um, RTK robots is that it's been the biggest concern when they were first introduced to the market, and they're still very fresh on the market now. But it's, okay, have you got, for the robot, clear open view of the sky, and for the reference station, have you got a clear open view of the sky? And the reference stations are typically recommended to be installed higher if possible. So if you have a house or a building, then up at the roof height. Mm. Um, but you mentioned also the increasing capacity when you go to RTK. Yeah. And that's a really good spot to talk about your maximum capacity machines, Andrew. Now, we, we were almost tempted to bring one of these into the showroom here. Um, it would have taken three of us to lift it up, is it right? <laughs> yeah, oh, it's probably more getting it through the doorway. But um, yeah, you can lift it with two people. So we'd 
be talking about the Siora range. Yeah. Now, I, I talked to Darren from Bat Mode a couple of weeks ago. I'll keep referencing this one. I believe he's now a pro robotics dealer. So he's started to get set up to be able to set up the Sioras. Mm-hmm. So the, the Siora is not really meant for home users. Is that right? I've, I've thought about it and gone, if I had five acres or if I had a customer with five acres, put a Siora there. But tell, tell me what their best case is and what they're intended for. Yeah, so the application for Siora is generally sports fields yeah. um, and golf courses. So it's big open yeah. flat areas. Um, obviously on a golf course, you do have um, limitations on the slope because some courses are very steep. Yep. Um, and yeah, it's, it may, may not be suited for everywhere on the golf course, but it can make yep. roughs and fairways. Yeah. Um, you can mow as low as 10 mil with a low profile. That's impressive. Yes. Yeah, so your product comes with two decks, um, and two driving units. So you can mix and match depending on the application. So there's a medium profile deck, which will cut 70 mil to 20 mil. Yeah. And then there's the low profile, which will give a 60 mil to 10 mil cut. Yeah. Now, I find talking to people about robotic mowers across the board, a lot of people are sceptical. Yeah. But I've done a demo on a robot with several people. I started with friends and sort of worked through a few different properties. If I put a robot on a property as a demo unit, after one day, they go, oh, that's terrible. Yeah. After a week, they're going, oh, that does a really good job. I'm quite impressed. And after about three weeks, I was like, hey, you know what? How do you enjoy your demo? I'm going to take the robot away. They just about cry. So coming back to the Siora with this point, if you're putting a Siora on a sports field and you're trying to help a customer get over the line understanding this, the best thing to do is a demo because they can see how it works and if it's improving their turf quality, which I'm going to say 90% of the time they should see an improvement in turf quality unless they've got like 10 green keepers working on a sports field. Look, 100%. It's a really good point you raise. Um, we often put smaller residential robotic mowers in and yeah, after a week they're not happy and then after two to three weeks they actually ring up apologising Yeah, they see how good it quality finish it does. Yep. Um, Siora, you actually get results a lot faster yeah. because it's a much larger machine. It's got um, three cutting motors on it. Yes. It's cutting systematically, so yep. you're getting results a lot quicker. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you, you do get the results with that machine. So yep. we, we are getting inquiries for residential properties because there are yeah. Yeah. And as we know, um, but yeah, generally it's more suited for those large open, open areas. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so the Siora, you said it cuts systematically. Can it yep. be set to do random cut as well? No. So predominantly it's designed to mow in patterns. Yes. So you can do parallel mowing, um, and you can, you can go north, south, southeast. You can yep. even change it to go on different different angles or you can set it to cross mode so you know it'll actually alternate automatically on which yeah. mode. Now I've googled and YouTubed Sioras looking to see areas where they are being used to see if the turf looks really good quality. I'm still struggling at the moment to find enough applications where they're being used. The product has been around overseas for at least two years yeah. and got really good traction overseas. Yep. Um, we started um, probably mid last year doing demos and trials. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we're starting to sell sell through. Yeah. Um, so there are quite a number of dealers that have signed up. Yeah. And yeah, we're still still working out what the best applications are. But generally, as we mentioned before, the big, open, less complex areas, um, you're going to get better results. Yeah. Um, particularly for that larger product. Yeah. Um, you may find an application to, you'd have to sell a couple of products. So you might sell a Siora for the large, less complex areas, and then you might sell a smaller AM550 EPOS machine for 
areas that might be complex or steeper. Yeah. So on a golf course, the solution might be a number of different products will be needed. Yes. So one of the things with the Siora we haven't mentioned mm. is the actual um, capacity that they have. And I know that this varies, like we said, with all of robotic mowers, it yep. varies according to what you're asking it to do. But when I first saw the advertising for Siora, they were talking about, I think, three different levels of cut quality and the capacity changes according to that. So if you want a really high-end cut and you said it can go down to 10 millimetres, you're going to be reducing the total area in order to get the better quality cut at that low height so that it's mowing more regularly. Oh, 100%. Uh, yeah. So what's, what's the range in area that we're talking about? We talk about, so I mentioned there's two different drive units, 544 yep. and the 546. So the 544 is designed in the best case scenario to open rectangle to cut up to 1,350 square metres per hour. Yep. And then the 546 cuts up to 1,800 square metres an hour. Now, yeah. they're actually physically size-wise exactly the same. Yeah. It's just one covers the ground quicker. Yeah. To get the extra capacity now, if the area is really complex, the capacity might halve potentially. Yes. Yeah. So we'd have to look. I guess back at your your question about cut quality. So that's going to depend on the application. Yeah. So you might have a really high end sports field. Yep. That is essentially cut every day. Yeah. You if we have a five four six which would have a capacity up to 75,000 square metres. Yeah. The capacity on that could drop to 20 to 25,000 square metres. Yeah. And that's because you're having to cut the area, yep. all, you know, a lot more regularly. So we talk square metres mostly. But mm. If you convert that to acres, I think you're talking about five or six acres when it's doing more complex areas and up to 75,000 square metres is got to be up around 25 acres. So we Am I heading the right direction more? 30 yeah. acres? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a, big, it's a it's tough a conversion. Big, yeah. It's a big area yeah. anyway. Yeah, I think, I think it's about <laughs> 17 acres, up to 17 acres. Okay. And, um, yeah. yeah, look, most applications, you're not going to be cutting the lawn more than twice a week. Okay. Okay, yeah. So you, your capacity, if, you, if you're only having to cut that area every, twice a week, you can have up to 50,000 square metres cut. With yeah, machine. Yep. So that's where you need a an expert or a, a specialist yes. robotic supplier that's training the product to actually go to site, work out how many square meters. Yeah. The other thing that can affect capacity is the amount of run hours you get. Of course. So a lot of applications you can only cut at night or outside the operational hours. So yeah. So it's not the capacity of the machine, it's the availability of the turf to be used for cutting rather than for playing on. Yeah, 100%. So, but obviously because it's quiet, you can also cut at times where you can't normally cut. Which is interesting for places where you have a lot of people. I'm thinking schools where you could cut in between lunch breaks where they're using it all the time and classes where it might not be getting used. Yeah. Or sports fields and golf courses have some similarities in terms of you've got three different types of turf that you'll be cutting in terms of rough fairways and greens and the frequency of cuts going to vary hugely on those three surfaces yeah 100 uh, percent. sports fields i think range from your hobbyist sports field where you might have some volunteers working on it through to Remind me of the names of them. So say if you go into Queensland, you've got the sports field where they do they hold concerts as well as all the big events. And the amount of work they put into cutting those sports fields is completely different to the one next door that maybe gets used occasionally or might have a local sports team doing some practice on it. Yeah, that's a really good point. And the quality of cut can vary, say, even between different schools. So you might have yeah. a high-end school that has a higher expectation on what the sports field should look like compared to yeah a school where that's not the focus. I've talked to a couple of people about potential for sports field applications with robotic mowers, and the biggest hurdle that I see is we've got volunteers. Why would we want to spend money on that? And I've pitched back to them and said, well, have a think about it. If you've got volunteers, you've probably still got a $30,000 mower sitting there. 
And those volunteers are probably not experts at looking after and maintaining that mallet. Um, and then you go through to the other end where you've got the really high-end sports fields. So the, the cost of the mower, the cost of the maintenance, and the return in terms of your turf quality mm. that will improve with a robot, Yeah, I think there's a good case there. But it seems like there's a big barrier there with some of those, particularly the sports fields where you've got volunteers. Yeah. A perceived barrier that they have. Yeah, look, it's, it's going to vary depending on... Um, yeah. One of the big benefits is obviously you got a much a, a much larger reduction in carbon footprint on robotic mower. So yep. um, a lot of schools are actually under a lot of pressure to reduce emissions. So um, it's not just about you know the time to mow. Um, some of the feedback we are getting is in in that particular application at a school it is hard to find people to mow um because people are busy and um and i mean if you look at the weather at the moment it's all over the shop yeah it's pouring and the next it's hot and humid yep um so it is often hard to find people or get the time to to mow as regularly as you'd like yeah so that's when a robotic mower comes into its own and obviously too it's a lot quieter as well yeah Sure. So there's a, a lot of reasons why mm. people could consider a robotic mower, but they mm. a lot of those sports fields that are lower, not the very high end ones, they mm. really see a massive hurdle with the financial side of it. Or, the, or I've got volunteers. <laughs> but yeah, yeah like, like you say, yeah. I guess if you're comparing the cut quality on a robotic mower to someone that's got, say, an average ride on, like maybe a zero turn. Yep. You do get a much higher cut quality because you're cutting with such a fine blade. Yes. Um, so, yeah, it's it's an interesting one. If if someone's got a really high-end sports field, they're going to be cutting with right-on cylinder mowers, which yes. can be very expensive machines. Yeah, I believe upwards of $70,000. Some of them up around $150,000. I'd say this come up on the contractor's pages in Australia from time to time where a lawn contractor that might be doing residential acreage and commercial jobs will occasionally do a sports field just because it hasn't been touched because it's the weather's so mm. terrible that uh, their normal volunteers don't get to it. And then a contractor will go, oh, yeah, I feel sorry for them. I'll go and cut it. Mm. And they're cutting it with a zero turn that might even have blunt blades on it or whatever the case is. It's still a massive improvement from a foot high grass to back to where it should be. But when contractors are looking in on sports fields, they're often competing with dedicated teams or volunteers that look after a sport field. And the difference in knowledge with people who do it regularly versus people who don't do it is huge. So a lot of the time people looking at sports fields may have good understanding of what requirements are or they may not. Mm. Um, and I guess that's where for Husqvarna having a specialist, you call them a pro dealer, mm. that understands those environments is the best person to look at how to work with that. Yeah, look, 100%. It's really interesting. I mean, a lot of the contractors I know and some of them are friends have actually told me they've come back from leave Yep, and it's just an absolute shit fight at yeah. the moment because the job that used to take them an hour is taking three to four yeah, because of how much grass growth there's been yeah. else that been away. This comes up with robotic mowers as a specialty because when you're cutting with a zero turn or a push mower as a contractor, you're used to going, all right, I might be cutting fortnightly. I might be cutting three inches of grass off when I turn up at a fortnight. Whereas when you're talking robotics and you're talking sports fields, you're talking about cutting daily or twice a week or three times a week sort of thing. And you're measuring it in how many millimetres of growth you have a day. <laughs> so the, the expectation, I think, with robotic mowers is you might be tackling four millimetres of growth a day on average in the growth season. And mm. with what we've had this year, upwards of 10 millimetres growth in a day sometimes. So it makes a massive difference. And I think that's where daily cutting can mm. be necessary to try and keep up with the insane growth we've had at the moment. Yeah, look, 100%. And probably one thing, when when you look at, we, we do have some contractors that have actually utilized robotic mowers to actually grow their business. So yeah. they see it as 
a way to expand and they actually realize that their client doesn't want to maintain the mold. So they're still going there to do the edging and yep. pruning and yeah. hedging, but they also do the blade changes and maintenance. Yes. So if a contractor was to put a you know, commercial or even a residential machine in, yep. they're still going to get work. Yeah, for but sure. And still be going back, back to the site. I've done that myself on a commercial site where I've got several robots that mm. cut down the amount of labour that's required to keep mm. the main areas mowed and mm. then still plenty of work to do with edging, with stepping yeah. and gardening. Mm. Um, and so there's situations like I've got there or other contractors I've seen which are doing something similar on a commercial site or if they're looking after a sports ground or something like that. Um, but there's certainly a good case for residential yards for the same reason where you can say, for instance, you've got a residential job these days, they range from sort of $80 through to $150 per cut. Yeah. You turn up and do that with all of your equipment, you walk away and then you come back two weeks later. If you listen to me, you might come back a week later and get them on to weekly cuts while it's growing as crazy as it is now. Um, you put a robot on there. And you can keep charging them the same amount, but their lawn looks better. And like you say, you turn up weekly or fortnightly and you do the edges, or you might say if you don't have the robot working the whole property, because a lot of Australian properties, you have a fence between the front and the back. So the robot might do the backyard and you'll hand mow a section beside the road. Yeah. So that's been a business model I've talked to a couple of people about before. It mm. works really well. Yeah. Look, a lot of the guys I'm talking to are talking to customers about having a maintenance plan for for the robotic mower. Um, yeah. And what we find generally, the people that are, you know, purchasing robotic mowers are either time poor or, you know, they really like the high quality cut and yep. they often forget to change the blades. I don't yes. know if you've found that. Yep. So it's really important, particularly for a robotic mower, to have the blade sharp. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think contractors shouldn't be afraid of it. Um, yeah. Definitely can add value to what they're doing. Yeah. That's been a key point I've found talking to people that have a robot. When did you change the blades? Have you done it? Or do you need somebody to do it mm. um, as a key point to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to do efficiently? Yeah. Well, especially now with the really high grass growth, with yeah. that, you, you may need to yeah, change the blades a lot more regularly. I've found with high grass growth, changing the blades will reduce the load on the motors Mm. because if once you've got 10 millimeters growth a day, the the swing back blades on a robot sometimes will fold back and not cut the grass if it's too thick, too tall. And so the, the need to have sharp blades or make sure it's cutting that grass often enough so that it doesn't get to the point where it's struggling Mm. means that you've got less load on everything. It's working more efficiently. Yeah. 100%. 100%. We have actually released um, some blades that have higher HRC rating, but essentially just yeah. means that um, a harder steel that's more durable. Yeah. So we've actually designed that for some of our larger machines and we've, we're getting really good feedback, but yeah, still you, you've got to actually, depending on the application, check check them regularly um, yes. just because you know, there could be objects like sticks and branches that fall on yeah. them, so which can cause premature. Yeah. So that's that's one of the negatives with robotic mowers. Mm. And I think it's worth touching on this, that if you are looking at using a robotic mower or you're talking to somebody else who might consider a robotic mower, yeah. the biggest detractors from robotic mowers are poorly set up or poorly sold robotic mowers. So a dealer who doesn't understand robots might say, yeah, this will do 5,000 square metres and not actually look at what the property requirements are. And then if you've got sticks, leaves, or grass that it can't keep up with if it's not mowing. So say, for instance, it says it can do 5,000 square metres, but you're pushed it to its limits so that it's not cutting that area mm. three times a week. It might only get to one area that's hard for it to reach once a week. And then that grass is growing too long and it's hard for it to keep up with. And then the customer looks at it and goes, this robot's terrible. I want my money back. Yeah. If it's sold well, then the dealer that sells the machine mm. will know how to assess what the property needs are and sell the right machine for it. Mm. And particularly in cases where you've got a lot of sticks and leaves, you need to be talking to the customer about whether they're going to be taking care of that. Yeah, exactly. 
it's really good discussion point. You you really need a consultative approach. Yeah. Um, I was at a property uh, yesterday um, that was about 400 square meters of yeah. uh, tiff tuff, yep. which is actually quite a popular grass. Yeah. Um, and, and they use that area extensively. They had four boys that play soccer on it. Yeah. So rather than sell like a, a 405 or a 415X, we actually quoted them on a 430. Yep. Um, because they wanted to have that extra capacity and only mow in a smaller window. So, oh, yeah, so a smaller time zone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's really important to find out how they want to use it. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. That's something we do sort of zoom from time to time. It's often better to sort of, you know, if you're talking to a customer, quote to say 430s for, you know, 5,000 square meters. Um, because you know the customer's going to get a good experience. Yes. Um, it's like anything really. I mean, yep. Mm. I've seen this come up where one dealer talking to another dealer, it's like, oh, why have you got two robots on that property? We've got one that can do the whole property with one robot. And it's like, well, you got a front yard, you got a backyard. Do you want it to travel around the house or do you want one to do the front, one to do the back? What's going to make more sense, which is going to give you the best results and best value for money. Yeah, look, three months of tailoring sort of the solution to the customer mm. yeah. rather than looking at the sort of sheer amount of area that we know. Yes, going, yep, that's the one for you. It's very much sort of, it's a personal thing, you know, like yeah. you really want to make sure that they're going to get a good experience out of the product. And sometimes that means that they need two mowers. Yeah, yeah look, 100%, 100% if, um, they've got their charge station in the backyard and yep. they want it to come out to the front. Um, there's a very big possibility that it's got to go through a narrow passage. Yep. The mower will be tracking a lot through that area. So yeah. have higher wear. Yep. So in that scenario, two smaller robots may be a much better solution. Yeah. And I see this come up where people are going, I want to push this robot to its limits. Can it do a remote area? And Husqvarna's answer is yes, it can do a remote area. Is it the best solution for you though? And sometimes that is a good solution, particularly if you've got an area that's got a retaining wall or something that a robot can't navigate. You can do a remote area and it's a good solution for them. Sometimes it's a better solution to go, let's put a 305 on that on that area where the retaining wall's a barrier and put a 430 on the other area. So I, I actually have a 450X at home. And yeah. I have what we call a secondary area, so I can actually yeah. out on the council strip, I can just place it out there and yeah. pause the mower has much larger capacity. It can it can mow for a lot longer, so I only have to put it out there on half a charge and it's done both sides of my driveway. Yeah. So for me, it wasn't practical in that application to have it run down the side of the house. Of so course. There's, there's lots of different ways um, or solutions to yep. to different lawns. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's also another thing that we kind of come across when we're talking to c- customers and things like that. They kind of, a lot of people go really um, conceptual with the whole thing and they'll say, oh, I want a transport path over here and can we connect these five areas together? And theoretically, yes, you can do it. Um, Mm -hmm. But is it going to give you sort of the the result that you want sort of Mm -hmm. thing? So, yes. Another common one that comes up, some of our mowers have profiles so you can actually pair the mower to more than one charge station. Yes. And I often tell them, look, because the mower is designed to be mowing regularly in an area, you'll get sick of it. Yeah. So after two weeks, those people generally go, no, we want the second mower. Yep. Whereas they would have been better off buying two at, two at the outset. Yeah. So like you say, there's applications where you've opted to go, okay, I'll buy one mower and put it in the secondary area manually. But there's a lot of applications where it makes more sense to have two separate mowers and really depends on the customer and whether they've got something that's fit for purpose so that they'd be yep. with the outcome. Yeah, so a, lo- a lot of people buying them can't actually physically mow a lawn anymore. Yeah. Um, so in that instance, it's best to try and automate it if you can so they're not having to move it. Yep. And, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So I think it's time to wrap up this section, but looking yeah. across the board at Husqvarna, You've got solutions for people that are on residential properties ranging from around 200, 400 square meter properties. So the really small ones and a machine that's quoted to do two to 400 square meters can certainly do something that's smaller. Um, 
but that's their range, that starting point for Husqvarna. And then you've got a bunch of machines that will cover property sizes that are residential, which may range from that size up to half acre, quarter acre, or even up to over one acre. And then we go up to the Ciora, which does the much larger areas, more designed for golf courses and sports fields. There's a good variety of ranges there. And going back to what we were talking about, having more than one robot on a property, if you've got a property that is larger than one acre, you don't go, I can't use it because that maximum size they go up to is 5,000 square metres. You go, okay, well, maybe we get a robot to do the area that we want to look really good and we might still use a robot mower to do some of the acreage mowing or we might have three or four robots to do a two-acre property. Yeah, look, that's a really good point. So a lot of landowner customers that are on big acreage, they'll want that, you know, could be a 1,000 to 4,000 square metres around the house to look immaculate. Yeah. And they might use a slasher for, yeah. for the rest of it. Yeah. So, yeah, it can work work really well. Um, and obviously that area is going to be mowed all the time around the house. It can be really nice. Yep. Yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, look, we do get a lot of landowners that will sort of have a 430 on one side of the driveway and then a 450 on the other side. And yep. they look great. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, yeah. it's nice. I've been asked from one person to quote on a property where they wanted around the house done. So it was a, about an acre of land out of a, I think it was a five or a 10 acre property. And I said, you know, we could set up a, to, you know, three or four robots and then have most of your lawn done. And the acreage stuff that you're slashing with your ride right on will just improve. And the whole property will look really nice if you want to go down that path. Obviously putting one on the area around the house is going to be great, but there are options for you that could do the whole lot and then save you needing to invest in a ride right on mower or make the whole property look like a golf course. Yeah. And we find a lot of people will buy one, yeah. one robotic mower yeah. to start and and then they obviously fall in love with the concept. So yeah. Yeah, it's it's obviously very big overseas and continuing continuing to grow in Australia as um yeah. more people are aware of the category. Yeah. Well I think we've covered the automower range pretty well and what they can do, what they're suited for, what contractors can can consider using them for. Are there any things we've missed talking about this or is this a good place to wrap it up? Well, look, um, obviously a lot of the outdoor power equipment companies are investing into the area. Yeah. Um, Asfana is no different. We have a lot of um, mowers that we're working on, but... Um, yeah. yeah, we can't really talk about too much about the technology. Yeah. Um, cause there's often delays, you know, getting it in, but yeah, we are working on expanding the range and there's some exciting products yeah. which will be coming out over the next couple of years and, um, yeah, watch this space. Yeah. Well, I think the Husqvarna automail range has probably doubled over the last two years. Yeah. Uh, can't wait to see what else is coming. Yeah. And Thanks for your time, Gary. It was um, yeah. really interesting having a chat about yeah, the industry and, and robotic mullets. Yeah, no, it's great. Appreciate your time too. Thank you very much. Did you know that Wright has several different mowers to suit different size properties and different types of work? They range from the cute 32 all the way up to the big 72-inch standard that Kyle loves. Well, all the Wright mowers are built to be used commercially and they have some great design features to make sure they save your business time and money season after season. Wright have carefully selected each engine to ensure it is very capable yet fuel efficient for the work it's designed to do every day, all day. One of the features that got me over the line with Wright is the AeroCore deck. It's one of the best deck designs in Australia currently, clearing huge amounts of grass when side discharging, while still great for catching, and it mulches well with a variety of blades. I'm about to throw a set of gator blades on and will be sharing my experience for sure. I get people asking all the time if battery is up to the task for everyday commercial use, and there are still plenty of people who argue that battery is simply not a good solution for contractors, so let's cover a couple of these topics. 1. Not every lawn and garden business will get a benefit from using battery tools. You should ask the questions first about what sort of tasks they will be required to do, and I'm happy to answer some of these questions about what tasks are good for battery tools, and which tasks should be left for petrol tools. 
too. What benefits do you want from battery tools? Some businesses will experience a greater return on investment with battery tools. This can be measured financially, but sometimes needs to be measured in reduced risks and problems too. Work health safety benefits are measurable when talking about no exhaust burns, reduced noise, and the noise being further away from the operator's ears. Vibrations in your dominant and non-dominant arm will most likely be less with battery tools, but a change in the balance of tools or poorly maintained tools can result in more vibrations to your forward reaching arm regardless of if it's battery or petrol power. So some easy tools to see the benefit with battery are hedge trimmers and handheld blowers because the list of pros and cons seriously favour the battery tool over petrol. But whipper snippers and mowers often have the pendulum where the pros disappear as the runtime requirements increase or the load increases due to long grass. If you run one battery platform, you might find you initially needed two or three batteries, and now with a whippersnipper and a mower, you require 10 or even 20 batteries to get through a whole day. This can be the line in the sand for many businesses, but one way to avoid this is to charge on the go, or bring your charger to the properties where you spend long periods of time. I've been using a number of Ego tools now, and Ego is a dedicated battery power brand. When I need commercial battery solutions, Ego has a tool and battery and charging options that allow me to focus on getting the work done and I don't have to worry about my day. Two staff and six batteries keep me out of trouble and busy working. Thank you for listening to Aussie Lawn Stars. Please remember to rate and review the show on the Apple Podcasts app or the player you use. Exciting new shows are released every Monday. Make sure you follow or subscribe to hear the next episode.